Uh, dear students, uh, welcome to lecture 5 of unit 3 in strategic management and in this unit we have been discussing about the corporate level strategies and in those strategies we have been specifically talking about growth strategies and uh, today the topic as you can see is internationalization strategies. So, uh, a little recap that we have discussed these uh, expansion or growth strategies. The first was expansion through concentration, then second was expansion through diversification, then expansion through integration, then expansion through cooperation, exp uh, expansion through internationalization and expansion through digitalization. These are the strategies which I had mentioned to you in the earlier classes and we have till today we have discussed till expansion through cooperation. So, we start with expansion through internationalization. Now, when we talk about internationalization, it is a very, very common term which you must have heard and uh, it is uh, a strategy which is followed by organizations when they want to move beyond their national market. So, when a co company wants to move beyond the country of its origin and it wants to go to some other country, some new country or countries then or it wants to move beyond it, it wants to cross its border then it is known as an internationalization strategy. Now, um, it is followed by organizations when it aims to expand beyond the national market. It encompasses a full range of cross-border exchanges of goods, services or resources between two or more nations. Now, if you look at this, you can see that it is not merely a exchange of goods or services. Of, obviously, when an organization will want to sell beyond its border, it has to take goods and services, but it also has resources which can be moved from one nation to another by the organization. Now, what can be these resources? These resources can be technological know-how, uh, how R&D, it can be people or human resources, it can be intellectual resources, copyrights, patents, etc. So, these can be moved from one country to another country by an organization. Now, for internationalization, the firm will need to ass assess the international environment, evaluate its own capabilities and devise strategies to enter new markets. So, uh, if you have uh, studied strategic management uh, before these uh, strategies, you must have uh, gone through the process of strategy formulation and in that environmental scanning forms a very important part. Now, any organization which does not scan the environment of a market where it is you know going to move, uh, it is it can be a failure, it can be a failure strategy. So, it is very important. So, there are many techniques of environmental analysis which which you must have gone through, uh, but when an organization is moving to the international market also then it is all the more important that uh, it goes for the scan of the international environment or that country's environment where it wants to establish its business or where it wants to market its product. Because there have been cases of failures, companies failing if they have not been able to scan the environment properly. You must have heard about this uh, very, very famous uh, chain of departmental stores in the US, JC Penney. Now, J.C. Penney and uh, you must have heard of this very, very famous French retailer that is Carrer 4. Now, uh, both these uh, companies, they, uh, uh, J.C. Penney wanted to move to the outside Chile market in 1995, Carrer 4 planned it in 1998, both these companies big companies, they had to finally shut down their operations in Chile uh, because of huge losses and why these huge losses happened because they were not able to estimate the, you know, the, 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 the demands of the local market, how uh, the people's preferences and tastes are and they were not able to anticipate the local variables which affect the business in Chile. So, they failed. So, that is why environmental analysis is a compulsion it is not a choice. Then 
an often used framework to distinguish between multiple forms of internationally operating businesses is the Ballet and Ghoshal model which was proposed in 1989. So there can be different strategies by which a company can go international. Right. So this, these strategies have been proposed by Bartlett, Bartlett and Ghoshal and that is why they, it is known as the Bartlett and Ghoshal matrix. We will take a look at this matrix. But before that, we need to understand that when a company is going international, then there are two set of factors which influence it, its strategy. What strategy it will take? Two factors are to be taken into consideration. Now, what are these two factors? First is the cost pressure. Now, you can very well understand that you know for any company keeping the co cost in control is very, very important because cost uh, one, it determines the price of the product and that is how if you control your price, you can be competitive in the market. And secondly, it also impacts your profits that if you are uh, you know, not able to control your cost and if you are not able to even charge high price, then what is happening? It is cutting down your profits. So a company has to take care of the cost part of their uh, products and services which they are offering. So that is a big pressure on the company. So it denotes the demand on a firm to minimize its unit cost. Cost can be reduced as much as possible by creating economies of scale through a more standardized product offering worldwide. Now you must have heard of this concept that if you sell in bulk, आप होलसेल में अगर बेचते हो कोई सामान तो आपको सस्ता आप सस्ता उसको कर सकते हो और कस्टमर को भी वो सस्ते में मिलता है सो दैट इज द थिंग दैट if a company wants to control its cost, then what it can do? It can go for a standardized product offering that is throughout the world, they are selling a common product, a single one product. As a result of that, what is happening? They are producing in bulk, they are distributing in bulk and the, the per unit cost comes down as a result of which the price also comes down. So it can be more competitive in the market. But the problem in internationalization is that you know even in India in a country like India within the country you know all parts are not the same traits and preferences people's ha habits change right across from state to state. Now when you just think of uh, the you know uh, the uh, scenario of internationalization wherein each country will have its own customs values traditions and in that case uh, you know, uh, it will be very difficult for the firm to market a single product throughout the countries. So there is also pressure for local responsiveness. There is a pressure to customize the product according to the local tastes and preferences. So that is, it makes a firm tailor its strategies to respond to national level differences in terms of variables like customer preferences and tastes government policies or business practices. Local responsiveness can be created by adapting products and services to specific lo local needs. So now you can see here we are adapting products and services to specific local needs when we are responding to, uh, resp I mean we are uh, taking care of local responsiveness and when we are taking care of the uh, cost uh, pressure, then we are offering a standardized product. Now these are to totally contrast with each other. If one is there, the other will not be there. If the second one is there, the first one cannot happen. Here you are not producing in bulk. So what is happening as a result of that? Either the company can focus on this or the company has to focus on this. Right. So you have to, in this case, in the second case, you have to provide customized goods and services for each part of the international market to which you want to cater. Now, as we were talking about the Bartlett and Ghoshal matrix, so according to CA Bartlett and S Ghoshal, the juxtaposition of these two key factors, which two key factors, the cost pressure and the pressure for local responsiveness. If we combine these two factors together, then we get four different strategies, a two by two matrix we get and these international strategies would be 
it is uh, shown in the uh, in the figure here in the matrix here you can see and this is also known as the Bartlett and Ghoshal matrix which we had referred to in the earlier stride. On x axis what we have taken is local responsiveness, the pressure for local responsiveness and from here to here it is low to high and on the y axis we have taken cost pressure, how much you know it is important to control the cost for a company and as a result of this out of the combination of these two factors as I said, we get four strategies. The first strategy is global strategy, the second strategy is transnational strategy, the third is multi domestic strategy and the fourth is international strategy. Now we will discuss these strategies one by one. So, let us talk about first multi domestic strategy. Now, if we uh, go back to the last slide, multi domestic strategy, what is it? Where there is high pressure for local responsiveness, but there is low cost pressure. So, that is what has been mentioned before you that there is low cost pressure and high local responsiveness. That is the, uh, the company is not much concerned about keeping uh, you know the cost low, but it is more concerned about you know customizing the products and services according to the requirement of the local market. Now, the company aims to meet the need and requirements of the local markets worldwide while customizing and tailoring products and services. Now, that is why the company will have a very decentralized structure where subsidiaries national, nationwide operate relatively sorry worldwide operate relatively autonomously from the headquarter. Now, when you have to you know make available customized products different for different areas, different for different regions or different for different countries, what you have to do? You have to keep your units decentralized, you, uh, you know from the headquarter every decision cannot come from the headquarter because the units or the subsidiaries as we call them, they have to have that autonomy in decision making so that they can change the products according to whatever the feedback from the local market they get. Now, this strategy it sounds good, but it is a very very costly affair, why? Because you are not producing in bulk, you are producing according to the uh, you know the demands of the local market. So, whatever is the demand you are producing according to that in small small units, right? So, as the demand changes the product also changes. So, that is why it is a costly uh, affair because all these costs are for each and every region, different for different regions, different for different countries. So, R and D production and marketing are to be done keeping in mind the local conditions prevailing in different countries. So, that, that the firm has to take care of and hence it becomes an expensive strategy. So, let us uh, again uh, talk about it. A multi domestic strategy, you know the, the company is treating every nation or every part of the market, international market as different from each other and hence it is devising uh, you know products and services keeping in mind the needs and demands of that particular pocket and that is why it is highly responsive to the needs and demands of the area or the region. Now, if we talk about examples of such companies which go for multi domestic uh, strategy, then uh, one uh, you know company you must have heard about Haynes, H. H. Haynes. Haynes is famous for its tomato ketchups primarily and uh, if you see into their uh, you know portfolio, you will find out that they have different uh, you know ketchups of they sell by the uh, same brand name throughout the world, Haynes is the brand name, but in uh, different parts of the world they will sell different tastes according to the demands of the local market. For example, you know in uh, UK, Venezuela, Canada right Australia in these all these countries customers prefer ketchup which is a little sweeter. So, Haynes will manufacture uh, those sauces which are a little sweeter, but in US 
people prefer sauces which are little spicier so there they will go according to the demands of the us customers similarly in india you know there are there is quite a uh, you know substantial number of people who uh, do not prefer onion or garlic right so in india hens will offer uh, you know the ketchup which is without onion and garlic so what they are doing they are customizing their product according to the local taste and preferences similarly i am sure that all of, all of you must have watched this channel mtv right now mtv what does it do according to the region it airs songs according to it does play certain international chart busters also but different depending on the region it will also play songs which are in the language of that particular region so as to cater to the local taste and preferences similarly companies like you know kfc pizza hut you have you know paneer tikka pizza you will not find a paneer tikka pizza in uh, probably most of the parts of the world but in india they sell because in india you know this is uh, paneer is a very very important part of the diet and paneer tikka is a very very popular dish so they will sell this product and very very uh, very very common very very popular mcdonalds now mcdonalds mcdonalds burgers will vary from area to area from country to country for example in many parts of the world it will sell burgers which contain beef which contain pork but in india they will not sell burgers which are which contain pork or beef because a large part of the population is sensitive about pork and beef so here they will sell uh, chicken burgers fish burgers uh, they will sell aloo tikki paneer burgers mixed veg burgers which they will not be selling in other parts of the world where uh, people not, may not very you know much enjoy an aloo tikki burger so this is how companies uh, change their products according to the needs and uh, demands of the customers then uh, uh, you have heard about procter and gamble now procter and gamble when it was trying to introduce uh, diapers for the first time for this long back brick you know what the brick stands for brick stands for brazil russia india and china so uh, when it was trying to introduce diapers cost was a very important criteria cost in the sense the pressure to for cost was not there to keep the price low was very very important because the the, the people preferred so it was a responsiveness to the local market basically so as a res uh, response to that it started developing its diapers from the scratch it did not just introduce some little uh, you know change in the design but it started r and d from the very scratch because it could not afford to compromise on quality even if it would made, make available the product at lower cost similarly a company like nestle now you must have heard this name again nestle very very popular so nestle you know kind of produces 8500 brands of products but in the international market only 750 brands are known to people of different different areas why because it is region wise it is country wise where you know where whatever is preferred nestle would develop and it would market that and it would it would vary its recipe its composition its packaging its marketing its branding according to the area specific requirements it brews you know it it produces around 200 uh, you know types of flavors of coffee but not of all of them are available in all parts of the world so it is a very very region specific or a country specific approach which nestle will follow
Then uh, so this multi-domestic strategy I hope it is clear to you and it was introduced basically by European companies you know Europe is uh, you know mix of cultures and countries so initially it was used by European countries to market their uh, products in different parts of Europe. Then we come to the second strategy that is the global strategy. Now global strategy is a strategy where it is just the opposite of the multi-domestic strategy. Here there is a lot of pressure on the company to keep the cost down and it does not need to or it does not want to uh, cater to the local preferences or the local requirements. Right Now uh, as I said it is opposite of multi domestic strategy. So, what is happening when it is opposite there we were selling customized products according to the demands of the market. Here what, are, what is the company doing? It is offering a standardized product worldwide and has the goal to maximize efficiencies. How can you reduce the cost? You have to maximize efficiencies, you have to achieve economies of scale, you have to reduce the per unit cost of production or distribution. So, you have to uh, do things in bulk. So, it uh, does this, it maximizes efficiencies in order to reduce cost as much as possible. Then what is happening? I mean the last uh, strategy we had a totally decentralized structure, here we have a centralized structure total the headquarter is in control of everything because things do not have to change according to different markets, they have to remain the same and subsidi subsidiaries are often very dependent, there they were autonomous in multi domestic, here they are very dependent on the headquarter. Right. Their main role is to implement the parent company's decision. Right. Their main aim is to implement whatever is being sent by the parent company or the headquarter and, and to act as pipelines of products and strategies. So, it is just a carrier or, or it is a just a channel of uh, if a company is parent uh, you know headquarters are located in America and if it is operating in India and if it is following a global approach then what will happen that whatever is being sent from the headquarter the, com the, the setup or the subsidiary which is existing in India is only to uh, you know give that away in the Indian market or to provide in the Indian market no changes are being done. So, it basically is operates on a hub and spoke model. What is this hub and spoke model? You must have seen the wheel, right? So, there is a central core or which is called as the hub, we call this as the hub and these connectors are known as the spoke, right? So, the center or the this, this is the headquarter or the parent company and these are all the subsidiaries which are operating in different countries. So, they cannot move away from the hub. If this is broken, what will happen? Everything will come down, crashing down, right? So, this operates on a hub and spoke model. So, if uh, we are talking about examples of such companies, there are, uh, there we can quote certain examples like you know, you must have heard of this company very, very famous Boeing. Boeing is an American company which produces aircraft, spacecrafts, missiles, right. So, uh, this company, it does not need to much customize its product because here local taste and preferences are not very important, right. So, it is producing a product for which it does not have to much customize. So, similarly, you know Airbus which is the largest producer of aircrafts in the world and uh, again it is an European company, again it can go for it has to keep a, a you know a total control on the cost and it does not much need to customize its product according to the local markets. Then similarly, you know 
if Microsoft produces a software, it comes out with the software, then it does not have to change it according to the requirements of the local market. A Microsoft software which will be uh, sold in USA will be almost similar to what is being sold in India. Then another is you know the silicon chip maker very very famous Intel. So this is again a company. now. You must have heard about this company Otis, if you see uh, you know in malls and uh, in uh, all uh, you know big places, you see elevators, you see uh, lifts, they are they generally belong to this company Otis. So again it sells more or less a standardized product. Then, then similarly Pfizer. Pfizer is a biopharmaceutical company. Now, this company also does not need to, uh, you know, change its product according to the much according to the local markets. Now, uh, for example, if a pharmaceutical company is trying to come up with a COVID vaccine, then in that case, it will be same throughout the world. So, this is how a global global strategy operates, right? So, actually it depends on also the type of the product which the company is selling. The third strategy is transnational strategy wherein there is high cost pressure and high responsiveness. Both concerns are very very important. Now, it is a very difficult situation to keep both the things under control or to take care of both the things. So, you would require a very very creative approach. So, this company seeks a middle ground between a multi-domestic strategy and a global strategy by trying to balance the desire for efficiency and the need for to adjust to local preferences tries to attain a balance between the two. It tries to create economies of scale more upstream in the value chain and to be more flexible and locally adaptive in downstream activities such as marketing and sales. We have discussed about value chain when we were talking about integration strategies. Now, value chain is that it starts from the supplier of the product, then moving to the manufacturer, then moving to you know distribution, then uh, moving to the customer and here you can have the retailer depends on you know. So, what this company will do because it has to you know balance between the two, here downstream it will do more of local responsiveness when it is going for marketing, distribution, retailing, it will do more of uh, local responsiveness and upper on the supply chain, it will go for the cost con uh, constraint. So, for example, you know for suppliers, it will choose the worlds from the world suppliers, it will choose the suppliers of the best material and who are cost efficient. But as far as advertisement is concerned, promotion is concerned, it can vary across regions. So, we have examples like Coke, Pepsi, they will sell almost the same soft drink throughout the world. What will vary? The, the Even the brand name, the trademark will remain the same. What will vary? The language will vary. Their advertisements more or less also will be the same. The language and the people featured in the advertisements will change. Similarly, you know uh, the uh, Hindustan Unilever Limited. When it came to the Indian market, it realized that there were a lot of challenges as far as infrastructure and especially how to reach the rural market. So, it came up with a very innovative strategy, it contacted females and 4000, 14000 females network they created and as a result of these, these females were interested in given the job of supplying products in the villages. So, it was a win-win situation for HUL also and these females also. So, it is characterized by an integrated and interdependent network of subsidiaries all the around the world. And the last is international strategy. International strategy is a low cost pressure and low responsiveness strategy. The company is not worried or it is not concerned about any of the two aspects. Now, yeah, this, uh, this strategy was not originally there in the Bartlett and Ghoshal model, but later on it has been included by other authors and 
majority of the value chain activities will be maintained at the headquarter. The strategy is also many times referred to as exporting strategy. It is very common among you know wine uh, suppliers of Italy and France or you, for example mango suppliers of India, people who export mangoes. So they will not be worried about the cost or the local responsiveness. So uh, products are produced in the company's home country and sent to customers all over the world. Subsidiaries if any are functioning more like local channels through which the products are being sold to the end customer. So these, this is all the four you know, uh, international strategies, I hope you have understood them. Thank you.